before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold Him He who heard humanity's cry Left His throne to wake as a child He became like the least of us Behold Uh, morning, everyone. Very good morning. Do come in and grab a seat. Really lovely to see you. Very warm welcome to Dundonald, whether you're here in person or tuning in online, whether this is your very first time with us, particular welcome to you, or whether you've been lots of times before. It's great to gather together. If we've not met before, everyone calls me Leddy, and I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, you're very welcome uh, this morning. This is an, uh, we call it an all-in service. So we have all age services, which we had last Easter Sunday, when everyone's in together, it's slightly shorter, slightly more chaotic. This is not all age, this is all in. Uh, And that means we're all in together. There is a a self-manned creche for fours and under, uh, if that would be helpful to you at the back with toys, with the video streamed so you don't miss anything there. That's for fours and under. Uh, Everyone else, we're staying in all together. So there will be packs for primary age children, to uh, help engage with some of the things we're looking at in God's Word a little bit later on. Uh, They'll be coming later. There might even be lollipops, I think. Might be. Um, In those packs. They're going to come later, but we're all in together. It gives the the kids' leaders a well-earned rest, and it enables us to meet all together as one big uh, family uh, on these all-in services. We're also starting a new series. Uh, We're in the habit, as many of you know, of going through parts of the Bible. Uh, And we've uh, looked at Isaiah... Last term, the book of Isaiah, and this uh, term, we're looking at the book of 2 Timothy, and uh, we'll hear more about that later on. Before we uh, sing, I'm going to read some words from Philippians that remind us that we're gathered together to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord and to point one another to him. Philippians 2 reminds us, therefore God exalted him to the highest place. And gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to acknowledge 
that Jesus Christ is Lord. We thank you for him. We thank you for his death and resurrection that we celebrated last weekend. We thank you that he's alive and reigning and one day will return. And as we gather together today, Father, whether we're new, whether we're older or younger, whether we've been Christians for many years, Father, please fill our hearts with wonder and worship at the Lord Jesus so that we might live for him for all our days. Amen. Well, if you're able, let's stand together and proclaim Jesus in song. Let's celebrate together the risen Lord Jesus. How can it be? How can it be? The one who died has borne our sin through sacrifice to conquer every sting of death. Sing, sing hallelujah. For joy awakes as dawning light When Christ's disciples lift their eyes Alive he stands, their friend and king Christ, Christ he is risen Christ is risen, he's risen indeed Where doubt and darkness once had been, they saw him and their hearts believed. But blessed are those who have not seen yet. Sing hallelujah. Once bound by fear, now bold in faith. They preach the truth and power of grace And pouring out their lives they gained Life, life everlasting Christ is risen, He's risen indeed Oh, sing hallelujah Join the chorus here with the redeemed Christ is risen, He's risen indeed The power that raised him from the grave Now works in earth to powerfully save He frees our hearts to live his grace Go tell of his goodness Christ is risen, he's risen
is no other name in heaven can be found through whom we are redeemed through whom your grace abounds no other name can save but jesus christ our lord let's declare that again there is no other name in heaven can be found through whom we are redeemed through whom your grace abounds no other name can save but jesus christ our lord My joy in sorrows, tears, my strength to cast out fears, no other name but Jesus, Jesus, my hope in darkest night, my broken soul still light, no other name but Jesus, Jesus. no victory but Jesus crucified no other cure for sin but that our Savior died no other hope we have but that He rose again He rose again my joy is so stay standing together and uh, declare what it is that we believe as Christians about God who is Father and Son and uh, Holy Spirit in the words that will appear on the screen. Together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. From there, he shall come again to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please do take your seats. And uh, it's time if uh, you're four or under and you would appreciate going into the, uh, the room at the back of this hall, so through the back doors, uh, there are some toys there. You can take your parents or carers with you and uh, they can watch the live stream. So now's the time to do that. So just as people do that, just for the next minute or so, if you want to turn to the person next to you, just say hello for a minute or two and then we'll gather back together uh, in a moment. Uh, I know there's a great buzz of excitement about the packs. They are coming, and there is a lollipop in them. Uh, but they're only for uh, children in primary school. So if you're an adult, you'll have to steal your child's lolly, I'm afraid. But um, I'm sure there are lots to go around. They're coming in a, f in a few moments. Uh, just before we, um, we turn to pray and sing again, um, can I just highlight something that's going on uh, starting again from Tuesday the 16th of April? Uh, we call it Life. And uh, this is something that we run every Tuesday in term time. Again, it starts on the 16th of April. Flyers look like this, and you'll find them on the welcome table. Uh, this is for anyone who wants to come and ask questions about the Christian faith. Uh, and so the format is a short discussion, a talk, and then a little Bible study in the coffee house here over coffee and cake. It's free, it's informal, it's relaxed. Um, we say that no question's too silly or too hostile. Uh, and so if that's... Uh, for you or someone you know, can I encourage you to come along on uh, Tuesday the 16th of April? Um, it would be good, can I encourage you, if you're a Christian believer and have been around for many years, can I encourage you to think about coming too? Because it's um, uh, a, a good opportunity to uh, have conversations with people about Jesus. And uh, if you did want to bring somebody in the future, then it'd be a good thing to know what you're going to bring them to. Uh, so do think about life. Fires are like this. Tuesday the 16th of April uh, would be a great thing to come to. Uh, we're going to pray now. I think, yes, we are. Jules is going to lead us in prayer. Thanks. Let us pray. In the book of Philippians, in the Bible, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Father God, whether we've read the Bible lots and trust in Jesus for ourselves, or whether we are listening and not sure who Jesus is, 
please help all of us today to understand more of why Jesus is described as a king that every be- everybody, everywhere should bow down to. Please help us to listen carefully to what the Bible says and please help Richard, our senior pastor, to explain it clearly. Loving Father, we pray for the life course running on Tuesdays, which gives people the chance to read one of the accounts of Jesus' life and answer questions. Please help them to come along. Please help them to find answers. Please help them to see that Jesus is the King who came to save us. Merciful Father, Servants of the Word uh, is one of our uh, church missionary partners, and we pray that as they aim to train people to faithfully teach the Bible in the Gambia and through West Africa, that you would be with them. Thank you that the words in the Bible are important for people to hear in West Africa, in Russia, in Ukraine, in Rains Park. Please help lots of people to get trained up to teach the Bible well. And please then use them to teach the Bible wisely so that lots of people can hear why Jesus is described as the king in their own language. And finally, gracious Father, thank you for the holidays. Thank you for chocolate eggs and sunshine and family time. Help us as a church family to love others by seeking opportunities to spend time with friends and family. Please help us to be welcoming. Please help us to take the chance to love others who are in need in big and small ways. And please help us to pray for others who may be lonely or sad or struggling. Please use us to show love and care, even when we find it hard. And please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer uh, together. We will be, uh, it'll appear hopefully behind me on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thanks, Jules. We're going to sing again. Uh, Children, if you're um, in uh, primary school, maybe you could help me answer this question. What's one thing that you really love about Jesus? What's one thing? Give us one thing. Maybe if you're older, you can also help. Yes, what's one thing? He's kind. He is kind, so kind. Anyone else over this side? What else is Jesus apart from kind? Anyone else? There's more than... Oh, yes, go on. He's loving. He is loving. He's lots of things. This song that we're about to sing reminds us that he is strong and kind. So strong, so kind. Let's stand together to sing about Jesus now. Jesus said, Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to him. No one else can satisfy, I should come to him. Jesus said, if I am weak, I 
take your seats. Isn't it wonderful that it's not just that we can come to Jesus, but that he comes to us, and he shows that by his death on the cross. Um, we're going to distribute the packs and now to the children, and uh, as they come around, you might want to stick your hand up. Again, if you're in primary school, stick your hand up, and a pack will come to you. There's some colouring pencils. There's a, a lollipop, um, and uh, there's a pack which will help you listen in to what we're thinking about in 2 Timothy. There's some questions to answer. There are some uh, pictures to colour in. There's a word search. And uh, we're hoping that these will be really helpful as we hear God speak to us now through the Bible. Is there any more in the balcony? There's one up. Well done. Great, thank you very much. Children, we're very glad you're in with us. We're going to hear the Bible read now, and uh, Sally is going to come and read it for us. The Bible reading this morning is 2 Timothy, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. And that's on page 1195 of the Bibles, the Church Bibles, page 1195. To Timothy, chapter 1, verse 1. 
Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Thank you, Sally. Uh, morning, everybody. Do keep that page in the Bible open as we're going to be looking at that passage uh, together. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you that your spirit continues to speak to us today through the words of the Bible. And so we pray that you'd help us to concentrate, help us to understand, and help us to respond. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So how? How is God growing the kingdom of his son, Jesus Christ, down the ages? We often think of God's gospel spreading across the world as it's proclaimed to all nations by contextualising ministries, but not contextualising the gospel, that stays the same. But what about down the generations? Over 2,000 years and counting since Jesus rose from the dead. In every new age, God's gospel faces new challenges, new versions of false teaching, new kinds of opposition, new vulnerabilities in God's people. Yet the gospel continues to grow God's kingdom down the ages. But not equally everywhere. The gospel is growing churches fast in Asia and in Latin America. But in Europe, gospel churches are few and far between. Indeed, in this country, evangelical churches like this one are growing generally but others are shrinking and closing. And here at Dundonald Church, God has granted us wonderful growth and multiplication over the years. But such growth is not automatic. Can we identify God's means of preserving and growing his church down the generations so that we can invest in those things for the future? Now, today we're beginning a new sermon series in 2 Timothy, it's the Apostle Paul's last letter to his loyal younger colleague, Timothy. It's written from prison, presumably in Rome, about 67 AD. And in it, he explains how God's gospel ministry can survive and multiply beyond his own generation. Passing through his ministry to Timothy, raising up faithful gospel preachers, as if in a relay, passing on the baton of gospel ministry. And this could not be more vital for our church as we look forward to a new generation of leadership in the appointment of a new senior pastor to this church. So let's begin the letter. Here are three introductory observations for you about to Timothy. First of all, it's a personal letter. It's a personal letter to challenge his beloved Timothy. So the letter is full of moving personal details and real historic ministry dangers as Paul prepares his younger colleague, Timothy, for great responsibility. And from this letter, as you read it, we find that Paul is 
Well, he's chained in a cold prison cell, expecting to die. So unlike his previous rather civilised house arrest, he's now in a cold dungeon, in criminal's chains, probably in Rome, awaiting sentence and expecting execution. And he wants to reassure Timothy that God's gospel is not chained, even if he is, the gospel will keep growing down the generations. We know also that Paul has been abandoned by many. He says that nearly everybody in the province of Asia has deserted his teaching. And now for worldly reasons, Demas, Crescens and Titus, they're all gone. Only Luke remains. And so he does want to prepare Timothy for the theological and personal desertions that he will face in pastoral ministry. We know that Paul needs his cloak and scrolls to work. Paul has no intention of giving up. He longs to see Timothy, but he also needs his cloak and his scrolls to keep working while he still has time to keep studying and writing and initiating mission. He wants to keep working to the very end. And Paul wants to encourage, warn and challenge Timothy. This letter is actually not the sentimental therapy for a young, timid and sickly leader that some would have us believe. Because when you think about it, Timothy was a seasoned gospel worker. He had travelled extensively on missions with Paul. He'd endured hostility and imprisonment before. And he's theologically mature. Paul has named him co-author of several New Testament epistles. But he has left him with significant responsibilities. And they are serious responsibilities. Because pastoral ministry is daunting. He does face challenges from within the church with false teachers. He does uh, uh, face increasing persecution from the state. And his responsibilities are heavy. So it's not that he's particularly weak. It's that the job is big. So firstly, it's a personal letter. Secondly, it's an apostolic letter for churches to heed. So it's not just a private letter. Paul writes as an apostle of Christ, outlining what faithful and fruitful gospel ministry involves. The final greeting at the end of the letter is plural because he intends the churches in Ephesus and elsewhere to learn from this outline of gospel ministry. And we'll learn four things as we go. Firstly, we'll learn what pastors should be doing. So here is the basic JD for all pastors and teaching elders today. It's a job description. Of course, more is required in every generation. In fact, the the, the FIC director, John Stevens, observes the range of expertise now expected of pastors, which includes compelling preaching, theological scholarship, staff management, therapeutic counselling, cultural analysis, strategic wisdom and personal charisma in a culture of cruel criticism is quite impossible and it's causing burnout and dropout and a very dramatic drop in volunteers for ministry training which is one essential, one essential remedy is to make sure we have teams in which pastors are appointed to cooperative, collaborative specialities, which is what we have at this church. We call it witness. The role has become enormous. But the core of healthy gospel ministry is here in this letter. And far from being useful to only those in word ministry, this shows us what we as a church need. Whenever you read about what church leaders should be doing, you're also reading about what God thinks we need from them. So this is not just about church leaders. It's about what we need from them. Wherever we read of a pastor, we're inevitably learning what God thinks we need to receive from their ministry of instruction and correction and leadership and to receive that ministry as God's grace to us, to recognise that through his appointed leaders, God is loving us and serving us. It also shows us how to train gospel workers. At a time in the UK when the shortage of workers for the Lord's harvest is painfully acute, as we hear Paul encouraging and warning and challenging Timothy, we learn how Paul raised up the next generation of gospel workers. So this letter is especially relevant for us at Dundonald about what to pray for a new senior pastor. Because I don't know whether it'll be news to you, but the new senior pastor, I don't know who it is, but the new senior pastor is not going to be the angel Gabriel or the apostle Paul. He'll be a frail sinner like your current senior pastor. And he will need a wholehearted and united support 
and prayers. He will. And this letter shows us what to pray for him. Read this letter and you know what your pastor, all your pastors, need you to pray for them. Thirdly, it's a Bible letter devoted to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, it is possible to so focus on the relationship between Paul and Timothy and on lessons for pastors and church leaders as to forget the abiding value of the letter as a Bible book contributing to our understanding of all gospel ministry. In other words, there are lessons here for all of us. So firstly, for example, even if you must suffer, guard the gospel. Guard the gospel. Whatever the personal cost, we must all guard the gospel entrusted to us down the generations, pass it on to our kids for the next generation of mission. We all need to guard the gospel. Secondly, even when it's tough, contend for the gospel. Like soldiers, athletes and farmers, we must all pass on the gospel of Jesus despite false teaching and do it for Jesus. Do it for him. Thirdly, even in terrible times, continue with the gospel. The ideology of our time will often seem wicked and insane, particularly insane at the moment. But we must all keep teaching the Bible because it brings salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And fourthly, even when no one wants it, preach the gospel. So even if it seems ineffective and unpopular, we must all keep gossiping the gospel to our friends and neighbours and colleagues in hope of the crown of righteousness that awaits all those who are longing for Jesus' return. So don't forget this is a Bible book for all of us to learn from. Right, let's, let's get into the text. Paul writes, chapter 1, verse 1, as an apostle of Christ for the promise of life. So this is chapter 1, verse 1. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. So Paul isn't just a believer facing execution, writing to a friend as he clings to God's promise of life after death. He's not just any old believer. Paul writes as one of Christ's 12 foundational apostles, empowered by the Spirit, commissioned as witnesses of Christ's resurrection to proclaim the good news, in Paul's case, to all nations. And the origin of this role was neither his own ambition nor the recognition of gifting by others, but by the sovereign will and command of the living God. And the command is to proclaim the promise of life in Christ Jesus. Now, this is the central blessing of faith in Jesus, who said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Life. A good name for an evening course. Life is the heart of the Christian faith. Now, this life certainly begins now in knowing God personally. All of life is enriched by knowing God through Jesus. Christians in the affluent West are often keen to emphasize the fullness of life in Christ now in order to justify a low cost lifestyle. But we know from chapter 2, verse 18, the false teaching of Hymenaeus and Philetus was claiming the future resurrection had already taken place and it was spreading like gangrene. In other words, it's becoming more and more popular to think that the resurrection had already taken place. We don't know exactly, but this could have been either the familiar liberal brand of falsehood that claims the only resurrection possible is an uplifted soul, And there are plenty of churches around here who believe that's the only resurrection you can experience, an uplifted soul. Or it may have been the uh, the more ecstatic brand claiming to be experiencing heavenly blessings now. In either case, it was diminishing the reality and the comfort of future bodily resurrection. No doubt that is why in verse 9, so the next verse after our passage, you find Paul clarifies, this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, It's now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Lord Jesus Christ, who's destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So he is speaking about eternal life. The apostolic gospel promises a broken and dying world, not only the spiritual joy of knowing God now, but the glorious future of physical resurrection into God's new creation. 
And look, for most of our brothers and sisters in the world, they're not living in comfort and ease. And they are longing for the resurrection life that the gospel promises. So the first priority for ensuring that the gospel grows down the generations is to keep proclaiming the gospel of resurrection, physical resurrection life in Christ, which alone can sustain hope in a cold prison cell or in a cancer ward in a hospital today. So will you pray that our pastors will, at least for the next 500 years, resolutely resolutely proclaim the gospel of resurrection life in Christ Jesus. And if he won't, sack him and get one that does. Moreover, this letter was written to Timothy. So chapter one, uh, one, verse two. Timothy is Paul's dear son in the faith in need of God's help. He says to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ. Now we assume that when Paul preached the gospel in Timothy's hometown of Lystra in Turkey, in Acts 14, we assume that Timothy and his mother and his grandmother believed the gospel. And by the time Paul arrived on his next missionary journey in Acts 16, Timothy was highly regarded by all the local believers. And like Jesus, Paul trained people not in a college, but by taking them on mission. For gospel ministry is a way of life that is caught as much as taught And that's why ministry traineeships are so helpful. Actually get involved in the practice of ministry and learn on the job. Timothy accompanied Paul on various missions through North and South Greece. And Paul commends him in Philippians 2 saying, I have no one like him. In other words, he's saying, Timothy is terrific. I've got no one like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. Everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know, Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Selfless zeal for Christ is at the heart of the best gospel workers. Notice how close gospel ministry brings people, even across generations. It's one of the greatest joy of being a Christian, growing older in a church family, is cross-generational affection. You don't get that anywhere else. So it's a, it's a lovely thing. But this joy is not experienced in just socialising. It's experienced in gospel teamwork. So if we're feeling a bit lonely in London, and perhaps many of us will be, perhaps serving in a kids and youth team or on the door knocking gospel ministry team, that will give us the joy of true family life that we long for as we actually get involved in gospel ministry together. So Paul prays for his true son in the faith, for grace, that's undeserved kindness, mercy, the forgiveness of sins, and peace, rest in anxiety. For surely gospel workers never stop needing all three. So there's the introduction. And now Paul gets into the guts of the letter. First thing is an encouragement. He says, I thank God for you and I long to see you. So the first is encouragement. Verse three. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. It's interesting, Paul begins with thankfulness. I mean, he's in a dungeon. He's chained, but he begins with thankfulness. It's the best posture from which to assess one's life and ministry and to encourage a younger colleague who's facing a huge task. In a culture marked by complaining, which is the heart of sin, we could all benefit from being more thankful to God, even within hardship. As Paul considers how to strengthen Timothy, he begins by reassuring Timothy of the historic and moral integrity of his own ministry influence. And Timothy probably needed to hear this as Paul's ministry appears to be ending in failure and disgrace. So Paul assures Timothy that he served God in continuity with his Jewish forefathers, that is, the believers in God. Faith in Christ, you see, is not the abandonment, but the fulfilment of Old Testament promises. And he says he served with a clear conscience. Look, Paul was a sinner. He had weaknesses. He would have made mistakes. But before God, he has served with a clear conscience. He's tried his best to serve God rather than himself, which in the end is all you can ask of a minister. Three times, Paul says now, that he remembers Timothy. 
Uh, not merely a nostalgic, you know, it's not sort of, ah, oh, do you remember when? It's not nostalgic recollections. He's remembering particular things about his younger colleague. He says, as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. There's no greater encouragement for a pastor, indeed for any younger Christian, than to hear a senior believer tell you that they're praying for you. And not only because it shows they care, but because, of course, God's wisdom and endurance is always a pastor's greatest need. By the way, uh, here's a great way to use retirement well. Uh, not spending all the time on the golf course, but to pray for pastors and leaders and for um, uh, the teachers. I, I was um, very touched, rung up by an archbishop in Australia. So not rung up, texted. He just told me he was praying for, for me and for other leaders in the UK at the moment. How encouraging is that? So if we have time, why not create a prayer ministry that prays not just for leaders of this church, but for churches even in Australia? All right, not Australia, well, wherever. He says, verse 4, recalling your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. Notice that Paul is not coolly professional with Timothy. He recalls Timothy's tears of affection when parting, and he expresses his personal longing to see Timothy to himself be filled with joy. And what an encouragement for Timothy to know that he fills the great church planting missionary apostle with joy. And so while church staff need professional standards, let's not be too cool with loyal partners in ministry. Indeed, now, as the South African World Cup winning rugby team had the names of their families written on their shirts to remind them who they were playing for, just in case there's anybody here who's interested in that, Paul reminds Timothy of the sincere faith of his mother and grandmother. Look at verse 5. It says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Now, being born again by God's Holy Spirit through the gospel does break all spiritual bondage to the past. We are not bound to the past. But to some degree, we do continue living under the social influence of our parents and our grandparents, whether damaging behaviours that need the gentle healing of God's word or godly habits that need to be encouraged and nurtured. So if I could say something to parents and godparents, sorry, parents and grandparents here, the most precious gift a child can receive from you is not just an excellent education, or the deposit on a flat, or violin lessons, or even consistent parenting, valuable though they all are. What children most need is to witness sincere faith in Jesus Christ being lived out in the rough and tumble and tears of ordinary life. They need to hear us read about him, pray to him, trust him, and try to serve him. Sincere faith is what children most need. Sincere faith is the heart of any healthy ministry and it's the most precious inheritance you can leave your children and your grandchildren. You may not have much money to leave, but if you leave them with a sincere faith, then you have served them well. And if not your own children, other people's children, children in the Sunday school, children in this church, it's the most precious thing you can give them is sincere faith. And if you have grown up in a Christian family, don't underestimate what a privilege that is. Secondly comes the reminder. It starts to crank up the pressure now. He says, fan into flame God's gift of ministry. This is verses six and seven. So given the daunting responsibilities that Timothy faces, is Paul just going to tell Timothy, just trust God, it'll all be fine. Don't worry about it. Very striking, he doesn't do that. He says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Okay, what's the gift of God? To understand what the gift of God Paul is speaking of, we should note that Paul says it was given through his laying on of hands, which is the familiar means of commissioning somebody to a ministry. And Paul has referred to it in his previous letter in three sentences, which don't need to be separated. It goes like this. It says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. 
Don't neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. So I'm convinced that the gift of God here is his teaching ministry entrusted to him and a commissioning by the church elders, accompanied by a prophetic sermon, presumably words given by God, suitable to the occasion. And Paul says, fan that ministry into flame. You know when you fan a fire into flame, yeah? So a fire is going low, and you either get some bellows out or you start blowing, you know, <laughs> you're blowing at the fire, or you get a piece of cardboard or something, you, you waft air and the smoke goes everywhere, but the flames all leap up, yeah? That's fanning into flame a fire. Notice Paul has told Timothy to devote himself, don't neglect it, to be diligent. It's not because Timothy is especially lazy or half-hearted, but because rigorous preparation of Bible teaching is hard work, especially under the pressure of many worthy distractions. Sure, a few pastors with a scholarly disposition may need encouragement to leave the study to meet some people, but most pastors are under immense pressure to do a million things other than prepare their sermons. And congregations and even staff teams can underestimate the hours necessary for fresh reading around a subject. I was um, um, chatting with a pastor recently, just coaching him in leading a network down in Plymouth. And he was saying that to prepare his sermons well, he needs two days. You know, he says, I'm not, I'm not a great scholar. I need two days to do it well. And I wanted to say, good for you, brother. You know, work hard because what the people most need from you is your preparation. And so Paul urges Timothy to fan into flame God's gift of ministry. To give his teaching and leadership the oxygen that it needs to flare up with heat, with zeal and passion. Because churches need gospel zeal in their pastors. It's interesting, 1 Peter 5, leadership is a way of serving people. You serve people with passionate leadership. And Paul knows that Timothy will come under immense pressure to give his time away to really good things like personal counselling, Staff management, strategic vision, project development, political liaison. But the greatest need of the church is his teaching ministry by which he will be equipping people for their ministries by which the church will grow in number and Christ-likeness. One, uh, Philippians, sorry, Ephesians 4 says so. So congregations and governing elders communicate their priorities by what they appreciate and by what they lament. And personally, I'm so grateful over the years for church members who kept appreciating Bible teaching, even when it's pretty ordinary, to appreciate the work that goes into preparing Bible teaching. But how can a pastor fan that gift into flame, give it oxygen? Verse 7, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love and self-discipline. You see, every Christian receives the Holy Spirit before being given their ministry. And the Holy Spirit of Jesus does not make us timid, but bold. Jesus was not timid. He was gentle, but he was brave and bold. The Spirit gives us spiritual power to keep going through weariness and worry. Love to keep working for frustrating, difficult and unappreciative people. Self-discipline to keep investing time and effort when others are taking shortcuts, dumbing down, telling stories, repeating what they heard in a podcast or just reading from a commentary. Let us pray that our pastors will fan into flame their teaching ministries with zeal, with the power of the Holy Spirit, with love and self-discipline to give themselves to teaching the word of God to us that we may benefit and serve God well. Pray that. It won't happen by accident. Pray that the new senior pastor will fan into flame that ministry because we need it from him. And now Paul arrives at his first great challenge of the letter. It's sort of the conclusion to the sermon, if you like, to to this section. And it's the great application. It's the challenge. Don't be ashamed, but join with me in suffering for the gospel. You may know that Jesus warned his disciples, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Mark 8. Paul himself has remained loyal to Jesus. He says in Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is not some small, weak thing. 
It's the power of the living God to save people. Every single one of us as a Christian here is testimony to the power of the gospel. And he will repeat in verse 12 that his suffering is no cause for shame because he's suffering for the gospel. But now it's Timothy's turn to carry the gospel baton. This is verse 8. He says, So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. The call is to be unashamed of the gospel and unashamed of gospel preachers, however despised their ministries may be. You'll often find that people will not have the guts to criticise Jesus. They'll just, they'll just criticise those who proclaim Jesus. And our instinct needs to be loyal to anybody who's proclaiming the gospel. It's quite stirring speeches, isn't it? So don't be ashamed, but join with me in suffering for the gospel. And uh, it much reminded me of the speech of Colonel Tim Collins on the screen, who became a household name after delivering his challenge to 600 soldiers of the 1st Battalion, the Royal Irish Regiment, before leading them across the border into Iraq to, to attack Saddam Hussein. Paul calls Timothy to follow him into spiritual battle. He says, you're going to need to be ready to suffer. Doesn't, doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't say, look, it'll be easy, it'll be fine, it'll be so enjoyable. He says, you are going to suffer at points in this ministry. He says, rather, join with me in suffering. Do it for the gospel. Do it for the gospel and do it by the power of God. Paul isn't asking Timothy to do anything he isn't doing himself. He's in prison. He's facing execution. And he reassures Timothy he will be able to endure. You can do this, young man. I know you think you can't, but you can do it by the power of God. But I want to ask, just as we close, to think about this. Remember, Paul loves Timothy like his own son. He's called him my true son. Paul is in prison, facing execution. Why on earth would he urge Timothy to follow in his footsteps in the same gospel ministry? Doesn't he love Timothy? Why is he saying to Timothy, whatever you do, don't take up my ministry. This is where it leads. Go and be a doctor. Go and be a teacher. Go and make some money in the city. This is somebody he loves and he says, join me. Join me in suffering for the gospel. We all need to hear Paul's call not to be ashamed of the gospel. See, the apostle clearly believes that the promise of life he believes in the desperate need of the world for the gospel, which alone can save people from hell for heaven forever. It's great to work for an NGO in Africa, um, helping with poverty. It's great to do that. But the best thing he can do for the world is proclaim the gospel, because it's the only thing that can save people from hell for heaven forever. He believes in the privilege of serving and suffering for Christ. He believes in the eternal honour awaiting us when Christ returns. And so he calls his beloved Timothy to embrace suffering for the gospel. I'm coming to the conclu conclusion, I'm afraid, and, and there's, a, there's a bit of a hard word for us here. I'm coming to the conclusion, conclusion that we don't have enough ministry trainees in this church, not because we have a risk-averse generation of youngsters. It's because we have a worldly generation of parents. We don't want our children to risk suffering for the gospel. We want them to have a nice, easy life. And so we won't do what Paul says from a prison, saying, join me in suffering for the gospel. So I think this passage calls us to hear Paul's call not to be ashamed of the gospel ourselves and not to be ashamed of gospel preachers. If your son or daughter becomes a gospel proclaimer of one kind or another, that is a great honour and privilege. That's not a secondary thing. That is a great thing to do. That is a great life to live. Even if you end up dying early in a prison, it is a great thing to do. Because through it, people are saved. My question is, is that what we're praying for our children? Is that what we're praying for our grandchildren? that rather than earn, an, earn a great lot of money that they will proclaim the gospel. I'm not saying you can't do both. I'm just saying, is the gospel our first priority?
So let us be unashamed of the gospel and of gospel preachers. Let us pray and challenge our own children, our own spiritual sons in the faith, to answer the call, to be unashamed of the gospel, to be unashamed of Paul's theology, to join gospel ministry teams who are dedicated not just to temporary relief, but to the eternal relief of the gospel of life and are willing to suffer for it by the power of God. Would it not be wonderful if from this church, from this point on, there's a generation of young workers, young people, men and women, who think the gospel is more important than money? Would that not be wonderful? How can it be that a church of our size doesn't have any ministry trainees from within the congregation? How can that be? It must be that our priorities are not right. So can I encourage us to pray? To pray that we might be unashamed of the gospel, unashamed of gospel preachers, that whatever our children are doing, they'll be doing it for Christ. I'm not saying everybody has to be a preacher. I'm just saying everybody has to serve the gospel. Let's bow our heads. And um, by the way, why don't we just take some time to pray? We've got a couple of minutes. I've rattled along. Why don't you take a couple of minutes just to pray uh, and to pray for the new senior pastor, but also to pray for our hearts and that God would raise up gospel workers for the future. Shall we do that? Let's spend a couple of minutes in quiet praying about that now. Almighty God, we thank you for the gospel of life, the promise that we can live with you forever. How we thank you for it. We pray that we would not be ashamed of it. We do pray for the new senior pastor, who have, whoever you have in mind, Lord, that they might proclaim this gospel from your word faithfully. We pray that we would support them with prayer and encouragement. We pray also that we would be people who are unashamed of the gospel ourselves, that we would pray for our children and grandchildren, and that we would encourage one another to put the gospel uh, at the top of our priority list. And whatever we do in life, uh, Lord, please help us to make the gospel our first concern, that people might be saved. Lord, please forgive us where we have had worldly priorities and concerns and help us to care most of all that people would hear the promise of life and live forever with you. We ask this for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. Be a good thing to um, carry on chatting over tea and coffee about some of the things we've been hearing, particularly that challenge. Might be good to chat if you're sitting with families. What sort of ways might we be ashamed of the gospel? Uh, what would it look like for us to suffer for the gospel, to make the gospel our chief priority as individuals, as families, as a church? But for now, we're going to sing our final song, uh, and it's a reminder that we have a very, very firm foundation to our sincere faith. Let's stand together, if you're able, to sing. How 
from a foundation you saints of the lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word what more can he say than to you he has said to all who to jesus for refuge have fled i have found my foundation he stands by every promise he's made faithful god never changing i will stand on the promise of Conceive the promise of glory that Christ is in me. So speak of my Savior, my Shepherd, my Lord. His likeness within me grows strong by His word. I have found my foundation. He stands by. Jesus has come to rely. They cry out for mercy. He will not deny that soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake. He'll Take your seats. Uh, do go on chatting, as I say, over tea and coffee. Stay on if you're able. If you're uh, here for the first time, we'd love to meet you and get to know you. There's a welcome table uh, with uh, lots of information, uh, and uh, we'd love to point you in the right direction of something that might be helpful to you. If you'd uh, like to chat and pray with somebody after the service, then we have a prayer team. Uh, they'll be down by these sofas to my right with yellow lanyards on. So if you'd like to chat and pray with somebody, um, then uh, feel free to come down uh, to the front after the service. Uh, Before I say a final prayer, let me read some words from 2 Timothy that we heard challenging us a moment ago. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8, to do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel. By the power of God. Let's pray. We thank you, our Father, for those who suffered to bring us the gospel. We thank you for the Apostle Paul. We thank you for Timothy. We thank you for our Saviour, the Lord Jesus, who suffered death on the cross. We thank you for friends and family and ministers and people you've put in our lives who've boldly put the gospel first and proclaimed it to us. And we pray that you'd help us to do the same. Forgive us, Father, for times when we've been ashamed of the Lord Jesus and of his servants. Please help us to prioritise the gospel in our 
lives, in our families, in our church, so that many more people might come to know Jesus and enjoy the promise of life both now and forever. We pray these things for Jesus' glory alone. Amen. Amen.